Um, so, virtual petabyte storage pools using Mars. Please welcome Thomas. So, thank you. I'm old school, kernel hacker, first generation or second one. At my last kernel committed from 1996. And in the meantime, I have not worked with LKML again, uh, but uh, my old contribution was a de-entry cache. And this time I have something which could be probably interesting for upstream, but let, let's look into it. I'm working for a company, One and One, is the biggest uh, web hosting provider in Europe. And uh, what I will show you is first a general introduction about storage architectures and their scalability properties. This is just for, for definition what I'm talking about. And then, of course, the main part is about the background migration, how it will work. It's very simple from a sysadmin perspective. And then um, I have found that many people are misguided, probably, by some, uh, by some evangelists on the internet, where you should, for which use cases you should which architecture. And I try to clarify this, but of course, there's maybe some discussion there. I also have a small look at the reliability of different architectures because I think it's different from what is propagated in some, some places. And then this is something which is work in progress or currently being developed. And okay, this is, these are the last slides, of course. So we start with something you probably know already. Big cluster architecture means you have a dedicated storage network connecting storage servers and front-end servers, where the real workload will take place. And an interesting observation at this point here is, look, any of these N machines here is potentially connected with any of the storage servers. This means you have O of N square connections. And in our use case, we have a web hosting, we have several millions of web spaces. In total, where I'm working, it's 9 million. So you can imagine the data is already partitioned. So if your data is already partitioned, because of course this customer data has to be separated, isolated, it means what the hell will you do with load balancing here if you have several thousands of machines here? Would you really like to load balance several millions of customer home directories over several thousands of servers, probably not. And that's the use case for another architecture called sharding, you probably also know already. The idea is storage plus front end is on the same machine. In our case, we have RAID controllers and hardware, so just a PCI Express card. So it consumes much less power, much less rack space. And of course, you just are halving the number of servers to be deployed here for, for the same amount of storage or for the, same, for the same workload. Well, what you need here is, of course, the internet access, but you need it always. This architecture st scales as well as the internet as such will scale. I think this is an important property. If you get into any scalability problems, they are likely caused here but not at these machines, because all of these machines are self-contained and there's no error propagation. If some of them breaks down, the other one will continue to work. We will go to that. And of course, well, um, many people think this architecture does not work because you cannot load balance it in bigger scale. And this is just the problem I'm addressing here. What I would suggest is having a smaller replication network and if you use Mars here, it's, you can even use traffic shading there. If you would use DRBD, which is very similar to Mars, uh, Mars is just a DRBD version, uh, similar to DRBD with asynchronous operation in background, but you could also use DRBD here. Okay, now let's explain how background migration works via Mars. You start, well, we have an old machine, host AIM, where some VM or whatever is already running, some workload is running. And we have another host where we want to migrate to and we just need enough spare space and the logical volume in our volume group. 
Okay, so it starts by LV create. Of course, you should check that it's the same size as on the other side before. Okay. Then the only command you need is, uh, well, I assume that the Mars cluster is already in place, so operations like a create cluster, join cluster, or the newer command merge cluster have been already done there. So you just add an additional replica here, right? A join resource. You say what's the resource name and what's the underlying disk data, the underlying volume group data. Just created before here. And then, okay, it takes a time, takes some time. We have some special use cases, some old machines which have only one gig uplink, but 40 terabyte partitions there, logical volumes, and it takes almost a week or around one week for syncing them while the data is being modified because in the meantime, the virtual machine or the load is running. And that's the crucial point here. The crucial point is that in contrast to R-Sync or whatever you are thinking about, you have one big block device, it's a big blob, and the data is modified, heavily modified in some cases, while the data is being transferred in background. And this is something you could do with DRBD or with, with Mars, I think. But you have to wait some time, for example, Mars RDM view command or whatever, some other macros looking, well, the, the data now we are ready. And when they are ready, we stop the VM at the old side, then we switch over the primary, sim similar to DRBD, you just use Mars RDM instead of DRBD ADM here. So you are switching primary rows and start the machine here, and that's all. And afterwards, you can get, get rid of the old data if you want to. So this is the basic idea. You free the space here and you allocate it here over time. And you can use it for hardware lifecycle, for load balancing and or whatever you, your needs are. That's the idea here. Okay, that was the key point. Now to the use cases. I think for the big cluster architecture there exists some use cases where you should use it. For example, typical usage is um, uh, my pointer doesn't work anymore. No, it works. I cannot see. Ah, here is it. If you have non meaningful key, for example, if you use something like Ceph or, or Swift or, or the like, uh, the original concept was having anonymous storage, anonymous objects with non -meaningful, non meaningful code, and these are constructed for this use case. And I never would recommend uh, just uh, using another implementation which does not provide that functionality if you have an original software package just addressing this use case. Do you have a question there? No. Oh. Okay. So, and uh, the next one, if you, uh, you have no dependencies between the objects, because I think this is the crucial point here. If your objects are in some way dependent on each other, for example, if you have a file system on top of it, this is the red case here, then uh, what do you think? You, you lose uh, one per mil of your data. Can you really continue operation then? No, typically not. You will need a file system check, at least with classical file systems. But some file systems like ZFS or, or ButterFS or whatever may, might claim that they can do better, but practice, a practice in our data center is you should not least uh, lose uh, even a small percentage a relatively small percentage of your data, otherwise you become inoperable. Because file systems are complex objects with some much important data, not only super blocks. Okay, then use cases for sharding, when you should prefer them. For example, if you have legal requirements, you should know, because you, you should not stripe all your, your objects belonging to some legal use case over thousands of server. If this is a legal requirement, don't use it. Then, if the data is already partitioned, as in case of a web hoster, then you don't, simply don't need this first to spread, spread all the data of one user to thousands of machines and, other, and, and afterwards try to collect it again in some, some way. Then I think structured keys like path names are also a use case because uh, it creates dependencies. So it's the opposite of just this here. Uh, any recursively st structured data with in-place updates, I think this is the key point. It's not only block devices and VMs, but many other ones, I think. It's something you should think of 
using a sharding architecture instead, because it naturally fits to it. Recursively structures, and then you have some structure in, in your data. And uh, another one is POSIX compliant file systems. Many people think that NFS and other file systems are well suited uh, for putting a high load of, on, on it, and it's not true. I've, I know of several failed projects in one on one where it has shown that you, you should, if you need a POSIX compliant file system for any application, please use a local file system. Simple, simple advice there. Okay, and then of course there are some gray zones as always, and we can discuss about them. So, let's look at an example about the reliability. I'm assuming here that I'm just looking at node failures, not at disk failures here. Okay, red means that some node has failed, and I'm assuming that we have about 1,000 or more servers. And in case of DRVD of Mars, they are paired. And in case of Mars, there are even long distances between uh, the upper row and the lower row. In case of DRBD, you typically will have a smaller distance in the same rack or the same room or in the same data center. In case of big storage clusters, they are all interconnected by the storage network. Okay. And for comparison, the, I assume that you have the same number of nodes here in total. So, in you just by accident get two node failures at the same time. Well, of course, you can get an incident here if it's on different machines, but and on different pairs, but if it's on, on the same pair. If it's on different pairs, it's no problem because you just hand over or fail over to the other side, whatever is needed then. But in this case, you get into a problem. Why? Because your replica are typically, replicas are typically spread by some random hash function. This random hash function means uh, that some subset of objects residing here and residing here will be affected. So hitting any pair here produces an incident. Well, there's an argument saying that the size of the incident is much smaller than here. But the probability for getting an incident at all is higher here and lower here. And that's the key point I want to address here. So if you use a simple model from the Stone Age, like replicating your whole disk or replicating your whole logical volume, you can tell where's the data, you can tell where's the incident. Here, it is really bad to predict, really evil to predict which objects are now affected and which not. Okay, now let's look what I'm doing with Mars. At the moment, we have some hypervisors. These VMs, in our case, are LXC containers. And we have several logical volumes, up to 10 or even more in some cases. We have some special machines with 24, up to 24 uh, logical volumes of one machine. And each of them can be in primary or secondary row, like in DRBD, whatever you need. So, at least in theory. Now, in this example, we assume that the logical volume number three originally was a VM running here, but now it needs too much RAM or whatever. And this means this node doesn't scale anymore. What to do here? That means we, we use ISCSI or the future Mars remote device, not uh, already, there's only a lab prototype for it. And we use this uh, uh, to go to another hypervisor instance where you have some spare RAM or whatever. So the resources, you have plenty of resources there. And for some intermediate time, you are just running the same VM there. And the next slide shows you what's the next step here. You are now triggering this background migration. So you get a, a new secondary, an additional secondary copy. So if you had two copies before, now you have three copies in total, or even four, depending on the number of uh, replicas you are creating. And this runs in background, while in parallel this ISCSI is used, but only exceptionally for those few hosts where you have some problems, some load, load problems or whatever. So this, you don't need a full mesh of N square replication network, or a storage network for it, but you should of course prioritize network traffic here better than here. So, and you can imagine I have no 
the, the next slide, I've, but you can imagine what happens next. What do you think? Well, it's just uh, switch the primary reloads to here, and then you have local storage. And afterwards, you can decide whether to deallocate the storage here or not, or whatever you are doing in future here. So this is the basic idea. What you should remember is that the number of replicas is completely dynamic. You can choose it at runtime for each logical volume, how many replicas you want to have at, at uh, which data center. I have even some scenarios with three data centers. And what you could also can imagine, the cost savings produced by that. If you are running containers locally on the same machine as the corresponding storage. So it's about a factor of two or whatever, it depends on, on your mixture, whatever you are doing. So I'm talking about several millions of dollars or euros here in a data center setup like we have. Okay, and what you also should need is that any supervisor can act at the same time in the role of the primary or of the secondary or whatever you are needing, needing. you can switch it dynamically. So you don't need a fixed assignment as some traditional DRBD setups are using. I'm trying to get more flexible here in the future. That's the basic idea. Well, now I'm almost at the end, so we have enough time for discussion. Um, current status. Well, it's under GPL and, and GitHub. It's an external kernel module, uh, out of three kernel module. But uh, I have also some DKMS script, so if you are a Debian freak, you can use it with some additional pre-patch, pre um, having only exporting some export symbol symbols, but, uh, and I also have one version in the pipeline, but only with all the kernels uh, without requiring a pre-patch, but this is work in progress, and I have not enough time for working on this, because I'm all the time working one-on-one -on -one problems. So this, my open source commitment is a little bit low at the moment, but I hope it will increase in the next, during the current year. Okay, productive is for several years now. I've collected several millions of operation hours in total. I have stopped counting it in total. The number of servers, I'm not completely sure that it's much more because uh, several other teams in one and one are also using it, not only at the teams that I'm more strongly connected to. This is the, the total number of petabytes installed at the physical level. I think the logical level, level is much more. We have about 10 billions of inodes for these millions of customers and so on. And it's working now. We have typically 10 LXC containers and the biggest one. Uh, biggest machines have about 300 terabytes in one machine, multiple RAID sets, 84 spindles and, and the like. And of course, with these machines, we have 10, 10 containers 30 terabytes each for the so-called quota customers. These are the customers who are just creating backups and sometimes even backups of backups. So, of course, special customers, you know, but it's only a small percentage of all the customers. Well, I'm currently working of, uh, at several branches here. You can find not only the master branch, but several ones. The one um, zero B branch um, will be a big cluster at the metadata level only. That means the data paths are what I, show, I have shown you before, but the metadata means that all cluster members, even in thousand nodes, will know which other resource is at which other node. This is, uh, at the moment, I have uh, the, the classical architecture from DRBD. So only pairs, one cluster is only one pair at the moment. And why a merge cluster? I can merge two clusters, and afterwards I use split cluster for getting the old situation again. This is the current status at the moment. But this, the future one is uh, having really a big cluster model, but only at the metadata level. And the idea here is, but already implemented for some parts, is that when you, the same resource is um, the, the, the fre update frequency of the metadata is different whether you have closely connected machines or hosts or whether it's a long distance or somewhere else. This is the basic idea to get rid of this O of N square problem. Okay, that, that's the basic idea here. Work in progress for some parts. My last slide. And you have 10 minutes for discussion. Current status, this is already done some years ago. We have replaced the original DRBD with Marsh, and of course we have the same model here. 
Then, at the moment, our project for, uh, we, have, we have even changed the cluster, our propri proprietary cluster manager, CM3, is, uh, is not for, uh, for general rules because some, our, our, some of our internal databases are even hard coded into the cluster manager. So, you don't want to use that. Um, the idea here is to have the mechanics of virtual LVM like storage pool, but virtual spread over thousands of machines. That's just what I'm aiming in, in this presentation here. And of course, the future would be if we would have some automatic load balancing or some, automatic, some automatics here. And this is probably something for the current year to work on for me. But it's more on sysadmin level. I would have some questions to you, what you would prefer. Go to LibWord, to OpenStack, Kubernetes, whatever. What do you think is the best to do here? I think that Kubernetes is not well suited to the model here because it's not dealing with uh, granularities like LVMs, like logical volumes. I'm not sure. So, but I think LibWord is something I should support in future. Do you agree? Okay, several people agree. OpenStack also, or not, or less. Yes, also some people agreeing. Okay, so, so just, just to get some feedback from you. So this is the current status and future plans, and now open for questions. Yes, or, okay. Uh, so, how does having heterogeneous um, container sizes and uh, workloads affect yeah. this architecture? Yeah, good question. Uh, typically, for not wasting space, the same logical volume name will be the same everywhere, but on different locations. So, you are creating your replicas with the same size, of course. And what you are regularly using is XFS underscore GrowFS, of course. And this is supported throughout the stack. You start with L LV resize, um, and then mouse RDM um, resize command. Then it's going up the stack. So the dev mars virtual device on the primary becomes bigger. And then, of course, you can extend the file system. What I would need from the kernel community is a shrinkfs command doesn't exist at the moment. Yes, really. I would, I would very appreciate if somebody, I think there was an approach to it ab around 2010 or two, 2011, but not accepted upstream. This is something I really could, uh, could use. At the moment, I have scripted some recreation of the file system. So I recreate it on the same host with a smaller size and then use rsync locally. Just for getting, for addressing this problem. And of course, uh, I, yeah. Extending your question, um, the granularity of moving around whole containers, playing container football with them, okay? Uh, well, this is our internal, we say playing container football, uh, because it, it's more like, uh, yeah, it's always approaching a football. It takes some time until the ball arrives at the other side, but okay, it's not enough, uh, because some, the customers, some customers, um, if you look at the customer distribution of the sizes, you have millions of extremely small directories, and it, it's a SIP's law, it's an exponential distribution, and only a few have several terabytes, because we have some tariffs with so-called unlimited tariffs. And these ones are causing the problems, and these customers should be moved by movespace.pl using rsync then. So, of course, co playing container football will not solve all of your problems, but most of them dealing with hardware lifecycle and so on. But in reality, you should have two different granularities for dealing with the problem. And I think combining both is really something where you can save costs and you also even can become um, more reliable. But what I should also mention is we have several self-clusters our company, and that all of them are operating as expected, with both respect to scalability and reliability in both dimensions in some cases. And I think, I hopefully have addressed the, the reasons I'm, I think. I have also started some theoretical considerations 
on an academic level. So if some of you is interested in that, discussing afterwards, I have even some prepared some, some graphics. I think there are cases where the theoretical model of Seth and Similar can be better, but not but only under the precondition that the objects are not interrelated to each other in any way. Otherwise, it's even worse. And interestingly, my graphic where I see the rest of the break-even point is, oh, is interesting about the same as the observation where the scalability and reliability limits seem to be from the practical observation, but I cannot prove that it's the same and it's the same reason. But it's an interesting observation. I'm trying to get a theoretical foundation for a practically observed problem. And this is one of the motivations behind it, that some things promised by people on internet or somewhere else, on conferences, is probably not always true. And, and this is, yes, but, but, yes, but, but I think it's not, I, I'm, not, I'm not firing against uh, another community here. I'm just trying to get the use cases correct. That means there exist use cases for this model, so I have to appreciate it. But there are also other use cases, and don't mix up the use cases. Okay. Another question. We have enough. Uh, uh, so, so I come from a hosting background, and most of what you said made made sense. What I didn't quite understand is why DRBD itself wasn't suitable for this use case. If you possibly ignore where you're now going with like ah, a metadata, but okay. at the level you're already at, particularly with async. DRBD, it seems like it would do the same job. So I'm curious practically why you went down this path or what um, you were trying to fix. Okay. In my last presentation three years ago, I think I have explained it because a DRBD is constructed for, is a RAID 1 over network. It works best and it really works well if you have crossover cables. So it's, there's no problem. But if you try to operate it over long distance and it works synchronously, and it doesn't really work. This is our experience. That was uh, the starting point for starting Mars. And uh, I, which mode? E, even mode A, because mode A uses the TCP send buffer. It's so, uh, some people call it even an asynchronous mode, but it's not really an asynchronous mode because it uses the TCP send buffer. And if the machine crashes, then you are losing this because it's in REM. Okay, and this is one of the problems. Mars is using a transaction log file, additional file for persisting all the log file data. If you want uh, to look into the internals from a more from a developer perspective, no, for some reason it doesn't work again. Well, on my screen I can see it. Here, even on this monitor here, so probably somebody should to check the inputs here. I have two slides from my last presentation from a few years ago. This is uh, DRBD plus proxy. Proxy is also an ad a commercial addition to it uh, for discriminating it uh, because of time, like I would suggest you, you read it afterwards. It's just, just uh, well, the main difference is here tolerates unreliable network. That's it. It's designed for long distances for almost any kind of, uh, kind of interruptions and so on. So if the data transport is much slower than the data um, creation of the data, it will buffer it until the buffer is full, of course. But you can dimension the buffer as you like, because it's a disk buffer. So that's the basic idea. Um, well, this is the problem, the, 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 the general problem with the RBD, because it has a bit, bitmap, and the bitmap has only one bit per block. And one bit is not enough for counting the number of blocks which have been updated in this long queue. So, for example, if you think you have a long queue of several gigabytes, and then you penetrate the same block again and again, then you have several versions of the same block. And it's, it's possible to work around this, but it's getting complicated here. And the Mars solution is just here. This is the primary side. One interesting model is the so-called transaction logger. Then it's a temporary memory buffer where it's appended in real time to the transaction log. And right back from the temporary me memory buffer is in a different order. At the moment, it's uh, by sorting, scanning block numbers. 
for performance optimization. And uh, then you have two separate processes which can be controlled independently from each other. That's the long distance transfer over the network. It automatically restarts on, upon interruptions or whatever. And then the log file applicator, which just applies the transaction log to the copy here, to the replica. That's the basic idea behind it. So it's by concept, it's simple, but implementation is complicated if you have to deal with races and so on and with, uh, and, and with logic. Logic with uh, and many use cases, failures, failures of whatever. Mars tries to, complicate, uh, to, to compensate any kind of failures as best as possible. So the approach is, yes, um, do, do the best you can do in each situation. Okay, um, I yeah, think we're out of time, time there. Thank you, Thomas.